Welcome back to PPCM's Painful Truth. Today's guest, Alexandra Berger. Hi. Hi. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for just your time today and educating us with your peripartum cardiomyopathy, PPCM whole experience. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and um, and your and and your name and where you're from. I have a golden retriever puppy that is literally just having, he's messing with everything right now. So I'm just going to ignore him. He's absolutely, you should see him right now. He's really funny, but, (laughs) and I don't, this is not funny. This is actually a very important conversation. So puppy, go away. Dogs (laughs) dogs get an exclusion. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. He's, He's going over to the other side now. Good. Okay. So- My name is Alexandra Berger, and I um, um, from where I live. I live in Vandergriff, Pennsylvania, which is about forty-five minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Um, when I uh, gave birth, we were moving from Pitts, the city of Pittsburgh, to to back to Vandergriff. So between there and here is is when all of this all of this happened. So how? I mean, how old were you when you were diagnosed? What was your I was 34. I gave birth at, no, well, it was, I was a month before I turned 34-ish. I was 33 when I gave birth. And it was five weeks postpartum when I um, actually got my diagnosis. So how post were you? Did you have, um, did you have a girl boy? A boy. A boy. Did you, so did I, did you have him, did, was you diagnosed after, how far along after that you were diagnosed giving birth to him? Five weeks. Five weeks post. Yes. Mine was three months, but that's, it's, I guess, you know, the, within usually it peaks and they say it's like between right when you give birth but it can also take weeks to kind of peak or even months so something was wrong during my birth mm -hmm. his birth Mm -hmm. i knew something was wrong we i feel like i got hit with a double whammy i um he he had a very we both had a very traumatic birth um he he had a, a large head and I couldn't push him out, but they had me lying flat on my back because I chose to get an epidural. Let me back up. I was in, I was induced. I had preeclampsia pretty severely. Um, and they were worried because my blood pressure was one, one something over 200 regularly. So they took me right at 37 weeks. Mm -hmm. It took them four days to get me to where I could push. And my pushing labor was four and a half hours long. My epidural had been worn off. Um, They told me that it's, he's too far down for me to have a C-section. I'm going to have to vaginally birth him and that's fine. But they had the way angle that they had me lying when they wouldn't let me get up, which I felt like I wanted to do (laughs) um, to get him out. And Mm -hmm. uh, a little nurse saved my life and put a, a push bar in. And I was able to pull up on that. And with two pushes, I got him out. And, um, I couldn't see him. He wasn't breathing when he was born. Uh, they rushed him away to the NICU. I couldn't hold him for three days. Uh, he stayed at the hospital for three weeks. And then I got him home for a little bit. And I had thought that I had, um, had some, some kind of chest, something was wrong with my chest. I thought it was, (laughs) um, I, I don't know. I was in the hospital. So I assumed the worst. I was like, this is some kind of croup. This is some kind of, I need an antibiotic. I want to get rid of this. And I want to go home to my baby. Yeah. I, I stay up for three whole days because I couldn't lie flat. Every time I lay down, I would count my breaths because I'd feel mm. all this like gurgling. Yeah. So I slept with my head in my hands, just sitting on the bed. And when my head would, would slam like that, then I would get up and they told me, 
um, um, they, my parents and my husband said, you need to, you need to go get this looked at if it isn't better in, in another day. But after dealing with all of that, they, my son, Jack, he, um, they told me about 5% chance of normalcy, normalcy in his life. They assumed that they would have a cerebral palsy diagnosis. He was diagnosed with HIE, um, moderate to severe grade. Um, so I was worried that I would be taking care of a child that's going to need me for the rest of his life. And I don't know how I, and I mean, how you're going to live. And then I was, am I going to live right. after this? And it was, it was yeah. just a horrible, horrible situation. Yeah. So I went Definitely. to urgent care. I drove, I drove mm -hmm. myself to urgent care, which this urgent is care. how convinced not sick I was because I was worried about how much the hospital bill would cost. Yeah. Getting a, having an ambulance come and get me could be sure. since I'm postpartum. And then after having a three week thank you stay with a, they cooled Jack. They, um, they lowered his body temperature. That's why no one was allowed to touch him for three days. Um, he ended up his breathing shallowed again and they had to put him on a ventilator for a little bit. So, I mean, it was, it was a well worth it hospital stay. He was very, very, where, where very was the hospital? McGee. Women's where? hospital in Pittsburgh. McGee. McGee. Yes. Okay. And so, you know, um, hearing all of this, my gosh, it's like, you know, you know, you're diagnosed as peripartum cardiomyopathy. And, you know, when I try to educate other women, it's not just educating for themselves. It's also on behalf of the baby that's in the in, inside. And that awareness is not and the education is not to scare of a, of a simple blood test, but that can really prevent, you know, the catastrophe that like you went through, just even the worry and the scare. If um, I would have how old known is he today? about this, if I would have known about this, I, mm -hmm. I would have handled this so much differently. I had all of the, sure. all of the symptoms. My husband yes. had to push, push me up the stairs because I couldn't walk. I don't even know, 18 steps to, to go upstairs to the bedrooms at night. You just reminded me, uh, my husband would push me because I was always such a athletic person and, and a hiker. We used to hike and he would push me to get me started. And he would give me like a, a, a push start. Um, yeah. Do you remember that, uh, honey? Do you remember you used to put, give me a push start? Yeah. I mean, so no, I, I can very, very much relate and with having all the symptoms and to not ever be diagnosed until after you give birth. And there's like a severe life threat for both you and the baby is just, just and in my lowest of my lows appalling. after this diagnosis, I did plow pretty deep into my medical records. Right. And I know that I, I'm not a cardiologist. I am not any sort of OBGYN, nor do I. I pretend to be right but we're not having all of the blood tests come back and everything everything was off it was askew it was so far it was so high there was so much wrong going on oh, that I yeah. got sent home on blood on blood pressure medication yeah that through my I uh, threw me a migraine it was just making the the blood vessels just go nuts in my head and just to be like oh you just need blood pressure medication now that's not it my the tops of my feet I remember walking when I was <laughs> home um, it felt like jello. There was a layer of jello on the top yeah, of my feet. Yeah. Yeah. Very, um, you know, you, you don't even have to really in push hard to get that indent mm -hmm. and, um, and the fluid that accumulates. And so, you know, a lot of women who are PPCM are also proclampsia. I was both as well. I mean, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an OB, but I also have common sense awareness of this disease and I've done my due diligence to know that the diagnosis that I was provided was completely wrong. Um, it, there was zero diagnosis, which is why I ended up with cardiac arrest death three months after giving birth, um, never diagnosed, never treated. 
um, not even at the hospital where I gave birth at Cedar sinai I actually went there seven days prior to my cardiac death before Thanksgiving. And I went there with 104 temperature. And they said that literally on my discharge papers that she is not ill. She has a UTI. Well, my kidneys were failing. Your kidneys fail before your heart fails. So shame on them because they still had time to catch it. You know, here now I'm drowning in my fluid, suffocating, hearing the gargling that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then it all come crashing down in Arizona on a Thanksgiving dinner with my in-laws that don't even know me. And I have a cardiac arrest, like literally there and like death and then diagnosed. So it's one of these things where when a healthy girl and a healthy woman have their t- suffering until suffocation, death, and not being diagnosed until after is why we're having this conversation today. Because I want to know how many women, they're saying it's it's not common it's your, you know, basically your fault. You got the bad luck with the draw. No, it is your fault for not having the education and the awareness and the training and knowing about the BNP test and knowing how important and life-saving that test is. And that whether or not we, you and I, we obviously had symptoms where visibly and not just physically, but most of five senses of, um, of our energy and our and, and all of our intuitiveness, like that we knew something wasn't right. And, um, you know, mentally we just, you know, knew and nobody took any of us seriously because the test wasn't provided with early diagnosis. So therefore we lived, you know, to talk about this and that it is so common so common that this happens. I mean, you and I are just one of like millions. I think this is, they say the statistics is every three minutes, a young, healthy woman suffers, either dies or not. But how could we even say that if they're, if our country does not diagnose, we don't, there's no diagnosis. There's the BNP that's cardiology. Gynecology does not have diagnosis. Other countries do. So that's why we have a high death rate and they don't, you know, um, they don't pay for insurance. We do. Um, they, we don't pay healthcare. They get everything free. We don't, but we don't also have the, the the help. So maternal mortality in the United States of America is, um, disgusting, (laughs) unacceptable, especially with the amount of knowledge, technology, communication, social media, all of the above, you know, that we've even had for decades. I even feel like how you, uh, how you approach mothers that have been diagnosed with this recently. I got little to no information at the hospital other than don't have a high sodium diet. So anything that comes in a can is kind of off limits. I, I I was home with a newborn. I I had nothing else to do other than take all these medications that are so teeny tiny, I needed a, a tray to put them in every day. I so that, that I still was making, yeah. I do that still too. <laughs> um, I, and I, I read so many or... articles, so many medical journals. I read about this. It, it, it's just an unconceivable amount of literature I put into my brain after this, that I, that this, this should not have, it, sh- it should have happened to me. That's fine. But it there, it should have been caught before I took myself to urgent care five weeks after having a baby that they told me wasn't going to survive. Absolutely. I mean, it that's should have been what, caught. And it, and it took me a year and a half of therapy to be able to talk about this right to someone and not either tell jokes the whole time, because that's what I do. I go in like, stand up comedy yeah. routine to mm-hmm. just, just, you know, diffuse the situation or to get past just speaking first. And it's, and it's so sad. And I feel like I got, not that I got robbed. I, I was an only child and Jack is going to be an only child because of this. I, because I can't imagine even risking one, one percent of risking doing this yeah, ever see, again. 
I know. And I, but I'm, I'm not knocking the women that do. If you do want a child that bad and you want to do that, just please put yourself in the hands yeah, of somebody. Yeah, go for it. But why has, would you give all that has give all back. your love to that one? Yeah, you need to get get um just find a good good doctor. Have a good team behind you if you're going to go for this again because you need somebody. I, I just think that's just too many doctor's appointments for me. Oh, I'd be missing too much. My son's three now. I'd be missing too much on what he's going to be doing. Absolutely. To, to devote nine months of my life to a whole bunch of doctor's appointments. So it's just not, it's not worth it to me, yeah, but me either. everybody's, everybody's different and that's fine. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I just, um, and okay. The diagnosis happened. Me being in the hospital happened. What shook me in my core was when my, uh, the doctor that delivered me came upstairs to the cardiac unit. Cause this is a very large, very, very good hospital. I don't believe that that Jack would have been ended up the way that he did is he's fine now. Um, uh, if he weren't there, I'm still happy I delivered there, even though my treatment may have lacked. That's fine. Mm-hmm. As long as he was taken care of. Mm-hmm. Now, the, on the cardiology floor, um, the average age of people up there were like 80. I'm running around like 30, 33 with like a, a robe on with tenor shoes. They told me to get up and walk. Um, they did the echo. My ejection fraction was at 21%. Um, and my, the woman that delivered to me came upstairs, sorry, I know the crowd tissue. And she said, I saw your name that you were back in the hospital. I don't, I, and, and your chart. I don't know how you're not on a vent right now. I don't know how it is possible for you to be up and walking around. And I just, that kind of stuck with me because the whole entire time wondering, thinking I'm taking my son to all these neurology appointments. Is he going to be okay? Is he mentally going to have something wrong with him that they're not going to be able to discover until later in life? Like they have up until four years to give a cerebral palsy diagnosis. We're waiting for like the other shoe to drop. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to drop dead. I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to drop dead right here because I don't know what, how all this happened. And it yeah. like, it ruined my first year of motherhood until I got that echo. Cause I, I think every, I think everything that it worked out that I ended up being okay, but it really is like a third and a third and a third, third of women stay the same or they get worse. You know, a third, we might be able to do better with medicine or some other kind of an intervention an LVAD is something. And then a third seem to get better and they can go on and kind of live a normal life. And I'm thinking it's going to be me. This is going to be worse. I have to wait a whole entire year for another echo. I, I don't feel better. And then I come to realize that after I found an amazing PCP that he told me like, this is anxiety. You know, you have, you have so much post-traumatic stress from everything that happened to you, that this will damage your heart more than anything else that you're doing. So get yourself into, get yourself into some therapy, you know, talk this out, get on some medication, sort, sort all of this out. And then, and then we'll deal with your heart, you know, because he said that out of his career, he's seen three women have this three, two of them are in their sixties right now. And I was the third and only 34 years old. He's the only doctor that gave me like a ray of hope thinking I'd make it to see my child graduate high school. Yeah. And, you know, I am a huge advocate. I got my I have a I have two dual degrees, undergrad and master's all in the field of social work because I've always believed in mental health. You know, I I have my coping skills are I went to school for over eight years in this field of mental health. I have such a passion for it. I even, right after my heart surgery, right after my mother passed away, because she had walking pneumonia, because she was stressed out that her daughter got this. And it was, I went to Washington, D.C. and made sure that that bill got passed through for postpartum depression, May of 28, 20 of 19, 2018, I had my heart surgery and then my mom passed away. And then, but I took the steps, even with, um, while I'm going through recovery, I knew that I was not going to be able to recover my dopamine, my serotonin chemically 
with trauma that was induced. See, I understand mental health. I also understand that if it's not conditioned or have any awareness for treatment, that it can turn into a disease, but it can be prevented. And it all comes down to accepting that mental health is just a part of your body, like your heart is a muscle, while our brain is the main computer. And I believe, because I understand mental health, that in a sense, even when I was dying, even before I had my my cardiac arrest and I had my, my death, I was mentally, because I'm so... You know, I'm tr- I'm always trying to mentally be aware because I I've had in my family dementia. I've watched f- my family members deteriorate mentally, and so I know that the mind can literally heal the heart. The mind can heal your energy. The mind can heal your spirit and what you give off. And if your mind isn't good, then your heart's not going to be good. And Absolutely. so I couldn't get my heart good until I got my mind okay. And PPCM really didn't take me down. It was when I lost my mom feeling guilty because, you know, just a long story short, you know, my parents went down like dominoes. At Love Story, their daughter got ended with peripartum cardiomyopathy, which could have been prevented. And so talking with you today and talking about mental health is like... It's, it's good conditioning of reinforcing that the mind is really, if not more important than the heart, the mind, the heart will mend itself. We have an incredible amount of function in our body that wants to constantly heal itself. And the muscles that we have all have memory. Our hearts is a muscle with memory. It re- also remembers trauma, which is when it people relapse. And, you know, um, whether it's relapsing around the same time of your heart anniversary or the time that you've given birth, it's because our muscle has memory and that might trigger it. So you have to do something kind and nice for yourself around your heart anniversary so you don't have a relapse because it is common you get the same type of, um, you know, memory in your body. Mine was Mother's Day. My first Mother's oh. Day, I spent the hospital by myself. I'm sorry. Mine was Thanksgiving. Uh, no, don't be. No. I mean, it, it, <laughs> uh, it am I thankful? Know. I mean, some people, I, every, I don't want to say, it's cliche. Some people have it way worse than you, you know, whatever. I There's I just, no worse. I don't, I, that's why Mother's Day is important to me now. I always, I don't, it's not about the dinner or the food. I don't need flowers. I just, I just want my, my baby there. No matter where in the world he may, he may be. I just I always want to see him on Mother's Day. So that's, that's what's important to me. And you're right. It is my, I feel like my heart got better because I got my head better. I lived every day so scared. I was just going to drop dead out of nowhere. And I said, I'm locked up in this house by myself with the baby. My husband's at work. Um, he had just started school to become, um, a funeral director at the same time. So he was driving into Pittsburgh every day for classes. This was before COVID hit. So there was no online schooling for him. Nothing was virtual yet. And I thought they're not even going to be able to get in here because how are they going to, they're going to break down the door. And then how am I going to call 911 with the baby? I'm going to drop him. And then I, it, it was really bad. I, then I got to the point that I thought I'm so sick of thinking that this is going to take me out at any minute. Um, I just want to just, I'm going to take myself out. I'm done thinking like this. I just, I'm so done. So they, um, it's almost like putting a big stop sign in front of your face. And it's like, the simple thought of, okay, a thought is just a feeling when you change the thought, you change the feeling. Yeah, it's simple, but it's almost like conditioning to the mind where you do have to place a stop sign in front of that, whether it's a, 
um a waterfall uh watching a rerun by like the eighth time just because you know what's going to happen so you don't have to think about it or want to really pay attention because you got so much going on in your mind sometimes i just do that just as of like you know just kind of like noise in the background or just piano it's just it's 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 so much better now my like i said my pcp got me involved in a really great Amazing. program yeah for um it, it was it's a it was dedicated this this hospital wing to a woman that um killed herself uh just after giving birth because of oh. postpartum depression yeah um i never had a depression diagnosis the my psychiatrist looked at me and she said you're not you're not depressed you have so much anxiety that that's throwing you into severe panic attacks mm -hmm. and that's why you can't even walk near a hospital without your blood pressure going off the charts you're sweaty you're clammy you look like you're gonna stroke out right now you know so it it was all it's so much anxiety came with this diagnosis so much trauma came with the traumatic birth and all of this that I needed to heal that I need to heal all of that before I worked on wa walking more, you know, so that I could breathe correctly so that my heart I'm could still get stronger. In, I'm still you know? in all that. Um, you just said that a woman that she took her life, which she probably just had a baby. Yes, yeah, she did. And she took her life because she was she was depressed that she. She was peripartum cardiomyopathy or she was just depressed or she was, it was just postpartum depression, but they named the wing of this hospital after her. And it's what a was group the name? of, um, Alexis joy. Um, and it's at West Penn in Pittsburgh and the therapist and psychiatrist that I had there, I could seriously, I, I thank them with, with every ounce of my being. It, they are the ones that that turn this around. They are the reason I can go to the doctor without having a panic attack in there. You know, I I still have my days. I have my times. People I'm friends with said, "Hey, I'm pregnant again," or "I um oh you know we're having a girl this time," or it's it, like all these happy things that I'll never get to experience again. I'm happy yeah. for them, but it it's a little. It, it hurts a little bit because I never had that opportunity to make that decision for myself. Cause the very first thing they told me was, okay, no more children. That's it. You're done. No, you're done. So, yeah. and, and I've now accepted that. And I think that that is the right decision for me because I am, a, I will be a much better parent to one than I would ever be to, to mo multiple. To, 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 yes. I just, um, I, yeah, you nailed, you nailed that out of the park for me. I mean, that's, I, I, I you hit it right on the nail. Um, I have to go back to where I delivered my son to see my cardiologist. I couldn't yeah. even get in the front door the first time that I went there. I took my my father with me who graciously drove me because I didn't want to drive myself. I mean, it's, it's shaking so bad that you can't even, you can't even go into the door to a hospital so much. And I, I decided to not turn hatred on any person because I don't want to harbor that hatred in my heart. So yeah. I decided just to hate the building. <laughs> so That's now, good. I just, now I just hate, I the, just hate, the, hate the doctor that didn't <laughs> diagnose you. That's, exactly. what I, that's, that's who I hate. Um, you know, I just hate the building. <laughs> okay. Well that, that works. I hate the building too. I, you know, it's funny. Um, I, my, I would, we would drive past Cedar Sinai medical center and I used to be so proud of it and I loved it cause it was in Beverly Hills and it's like, you know, um, my what mom you hear was, about on the news. Isn't that the best of the best on the West coast, right? It's supposed to be the best in Beverly Hills with the best insurance, East and West Tower, the best of the best, but nobody's the best with lack of awareness until the very bitter end. I mean, literally, I showed every sign, including 104 temperature. Seven days later, they induced a cardiac arrest, November 21st, 2021. Uh, actually, um, famous actor Robert, his daughter Leah just died there. And so this is why I started... To, this is why I started this docu series and podcast because they should have learned from my experience. I lived. I had cardiac death. I was in a hyperthermia coma. I went. I don't. It doesn't matter if a woman even was diagnosed during pregnancy, which is usually either in Canada or somewhere outside of the United States. They're diagnosed during pregnancy before there's a threat, but they're still at a threat. 
Um, but it's it's one of these things where I am with my whole being that I lived and other women like myself, like you, the, you know, four, one out of four women in the United States, so we know of, is is uh is just unacceptable and this docu series is because also not only was the best of the best in Beverly Hills you know fine they didn't have awareness with me but i gave them the awareness after and they still have had deaths after childbirth for women and babies and i go back to them i've never sued I've never wanted to sue. I was pushed to one time and I thought about it, but I thought that's not going to get me anywhere, but they're not listening. And I was getting angry because the high risk management left me for hanging and dangling for about over a year. Well, you can't even sue after. I mean, it was awful. The lack of respect, if you come back from maternal mortality death, like I did, is less than zero as well as the awareness. Now, the unwillingness to learn and to be educated and the un and and not taking my experience as educational, utilizing policy and practice, utilizing the information that I have, not to be fearful of the education and the experience that I've learned with the BNP test with you know, the tests that should be diagnosed in America that aren't and mandatory and all the other labs and screenings for all pregnancies. The fact that this has been blown off, you were blown off the entire pregnancy. You have showed signs way before if your husband's literally pushing you up, you know, shame on them and good for you for giving me your time today and actually saying, I'm an American woman. I was never diagnosed. My life was at a threat and so was my baby. And I am have been severely affected. And, you know, shame, shame on them, not just your doctors that never diagnosed you, never treated you. I'm sure they were lovely people. I'm sure that they have lovely families and I'm sure that, you know, they care, but they just didn't have the awareness. And it doesn't matter if you are the best. It doesn't matter if you're the most caring. Nobody, nobody in the medical community that doesn't have awareness is far from the best. Nobody, I just think nobody deserves this. This is supposed to be, a this is supposed to be the thing. happiest time of anyone's life. And I can N you nothing got robbed happy, of it. Nothing happy happened to me. I, I no. spent Mother's Day alone in in a hospital like right. that. It that, and I, I have a I have a whole lifetime to figure out what else we can do to make up for that. I never got right. any newborn pictures because his head just lo looked like it was just boggy. It looked like the brain was actually exposed. Was how messed up well he was born with a skull fracture and a brain bleed because i was too small to push him down there so you but should they told have me never they had vaginal especially with heart failure you should have had c-section at like no or no later than 38 weeks i um and i'm I not a doctor remember them putting an oxygen mask on me after he was born week? and that that was the first time i felt like i could breathe how many forever. weeks were you pregnant a 37 plus four see exactly i the, uh, my, the oxygen point exactly. mask after giving birth to him i felt like i was on top of like the colorado rockies i'm like this mm. is the best air in the world <laughs> where mm -hmm. has this been like the mm. past eight months you know i just right. the, that shouldn't have happened none of this should have happened i just no. I, I i i'm i feel so good for the women that had a relatively normal or yes. a, a happy delivery or something without complications because I had all the complications. And then on top of that, worrying to see if, if Jack would walk, he, he walked at 17 months and one week. So that was 
three weeks before uh, something's wrong, he's not walking. And I, and we got him help. We got him physical therapy that came to the house and really did that. And he, he was kind of a late talker and he was only saying one syllable. Here I am thinking that this child is going to not mentally have the capacity to ever even live on his own. Like something really awful happened. He lost oxygen. Like, why would they put me through this? And my mom during the birth, she, cause I wanted to relive it. I was like an emotional cutter. I want to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, cause I feel like pain made it feel real again. Yeah. Because when I, cause I was going on four days, no sleep in that hospital because mm-hmm. all the Pitocin they pumped into me I made it. me, um, made me, it, it wasn't working. It wasn't working. Right. So, um, they threw me into contractions one an hour for a whole entire hour before they came and like took that off. And then I had mm-hmm. fluids. Con- they were giving me even more fluid, which, which is, is what you're not supposed to do. Well, I know you're so, full of uh, fluid. They induced here I it. Am. Oh, here gosh. I am the whole time. And it, yeah, I, she looked at me, she said, I thought we were going to lose Joe. She's like, you turn gray, you stop breathing. Your eyes are rolling in the back of your head. She's like, for, for you to be like really pushing for four and a half hours with <sighs> nothing to show for it. It was, it was horrible. And I just remember com- acting like a complete jerk. And they were like, do you want the baby on your chest? And I said, I'm disgusting. I'm sweaty. I'm cu- like, I soaked through my hospital gown. I don't want a baby put on me. I, I'm, I'm gross right now. I'm 40 no shower. You know what I mean? Like I, uh, yes, I would take him. I would take him if I rolled around in mud. I didn't know that something was going to be wrong with him, but I wouldn't ever be able to hold him. You know, like, it, nothing happened that I wanted the, that it was supposed to. And then everything with me and they really wanted me to breastfeed. They were pressuring me while he was in the NICU, but he wasn't taking anything. They had a feeding tube through his stomach because they had to, he wasn't giving the right suck. So they couldn't mm-hmm. even, they can't even put breast milk through the, <clears throat> the feeding tube. So it would have been null and void anyway. Mm-hmm. And then I just, this was all just so wrong. I wish that yeah. somebody that was a counselor or somebody that would have, I wish somebody would have asked me, is there anything you need? Can I do something for you? How are you dealing with all of this right now? Could we go through your thoughts and emotions? Whoever it may be. I don't, it, a nurse, a doctor, some, some social worker, somebody should have said to me, are you processing this? And no one did. And you're just no, there did, and you're yeah. alone. No and one did for me either. I get that. Th- that that was my That's, huge hang up. I almost can. Yeah. I know that the pro BNP that isn't, you know, we're trying hard to get this on to, because it's sure. just, you could add it to a blood test. I get it. I get to some of these doctors. It's just one page and all of their textbooks for of everything that they've ever learned that PPCM is just, just one excerpt and it's not, it's not researched the way that it, that it should have been so far you know we do need the funds we do need the money to go to go towards it and there's no way that us in the united states of america should have a female mortality rate that high during childbirth people in third world countries birth without any any kind of hospitalization we're bringing people into a hospital and we're still dying at higher rates yep and i notice the difference between the American women and the Canadian and the UK and the ones where they do have the diagnosis that Dr. James Fett talks about, the SFLT1 and the PIGF, Absolutely. which is provided That's in all, gynecology. All of, paperwork, all of the paperwork, every single medical journal article I've read because I so you never know that So you, you know that it's not FDA approved? His in America doc, and they guy. won't and they won't approve it <laughs> they won't approve it and every time I call and I've called maybe four times in different times because I've had different girls where I've like let me just reach out to them again let me see if that kit and the instrument is available and they keep saying oh in a, a year and a half okay well that the last time I called was um around my round my mother's death my my mom passed away on on september 4th and it was i'm so sorry thank you i my love i mean i 
uh, walking pneumonia, you know, you can really, a mother can really get sick when her daughter's not well. I mean, hello and die. But, you know, it just happens just so fast. Um, but it's a, it's amazing how I could lost chain of thought now. What was I just saying? With the do- Dr. Fett's test and the testing and everything. Yes. The, the, they won't approve it. The kit, they won't approve it. This was on September 4th, 2021, that they said would take another year and a half. So maybe 2024 to call back. So that's when I, re- you know, I've been pushing my cardiologist, Dr. Carol Watson at UCLA. I got her, you know, we, she has a study that she introduced and now they do a Zoom call with gynecology and the cardiologist is educating the gynecologist at UCLA. And she is the director of the Barbara Streisand's Women Heart Association Program Fund and also runs the Women's Heart Center at UCLA in California. She's the one that did my heart surgery on Valentine's Day, um, 2018, right before my mom passed, and she, you know, removed a deadly defibrillator and saved my life from post peripartum. But with that, I educated her that survivors are going to their birthing professionals, trying to educate them. It goes in one ear out the other, and they do not apply the information. The BMP test, even after five years, I've yet to find one. OBGYN that has even taken me on as a patient to even know because I'm told I can't have children that, you know, because my, you know, my veins are are just so, so bad that during the period that I shouldn't have a baby, how am I going to have birth control? Now you were talking about how nobody has went up to you. Nobody advocated for you. Nobody, no. not mentally, not financially, not, you know, a, 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 an actual system within the, the category of women who suffer from maternal mortality and live. There is no system, no care, no advocacy, and they actually raise your stress because they notify the DNV, you get your license, you, you everything goes up $10,000 more in your insurance because you're now a, a liability. They make nothing easy for women down the line. And that's when I say this documentary is to show that the medical community and the cardiology need to step up and make this test mandatory. Now, Absolutely. <clears throat> you and talk it, about it's your son. It's so important to find a good cardiologist that you trust. And uh, yes. like I said, mine mine happens to be at the same hospital that I delivered, which is which is fine. I'm I've I've made it through that trauma. Right. And he is amazing. He's amazing okay. and he listens and he takes my thoughts into consideration because he knows that I have I have steno notebooks full of my blood pressure and well, my I was going to ask you, what's your rate. EF today? What's um, your percent? 55 to 60. Okay, good. So you're like pretty much recovered in a sense. He where... considers anything over 55 recovered. And what the tech saw was about 64. And he okay. aired on caution and wrote me down for 60. So okay. I'm, I'm good. And I'm do you know... on lifelong meds though. I don't. Oh, I don't yeah, want being absolutely. Off. No. I, Why would you want to? No. No, I'm good. Everything's good. good. Great. No, I love that cuz I'm I'm, you know, I'm pro like of, you know, the good medication. I don't like anything addictive. I don't request it. Um, I, I I think that yeah. doctors that put on uh medication to young girls that are PPCM, I won't name names, but you know, there's young as now 20 years old and they're on, um, you know, addictive medication with, it's just not okay. It's, it's, it's doesn't help long-term. Yes. It might help in the short term. I believe in the process of the medication. It takes a full year for it to work 
once it you you're in it for a full year it takes another year to nourish and then you feel fantastic i would even say a year and a half to two years you're golden and that's when usually people go off of it when they start feeling good but then they forget that the medication is what got them to feel good and you conditioned your Mm -hmm. mind all that time in your body to ingest it for it to acclimate itself why go off of it because it took you that long to condition your body and to get it was and to hard nurture. The, be- the beta blocker combination because i didn't go on an sure. extra right. i went straight just on an ace inhibitor and a beta blocker that knocked me out i felt yeah. every day like i did not sleep at all and that took a full i would say almost two years for me, like the sure. brain fog, the, to be able to run again, you know, yeah, just all, all of that stuff. I just, um, it, well, it was know, an adjustment. It full, and I don't, it, I don't want to get off of it. If I don't have to get off of it, I don't want to. No, it's not doing anything no, to hurt me. So I feel like it's my little safety net. Yeah. If it's not broken, don't fix it. And if it's uh-huh. broken, fix it. You know, we got, was just, you know, 2022, we have modern medicine, you know, it works great. I that's my suggestion to 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 many. And, you know, I think that, you know, knowing about the NT Pro BNP test and now knowing how wonderful this test is, I have my son's BNP on the on the refrigerator. I he's five. I'm I, I've been pushing, not poking him, but I've been planning it in his head. You know, we must need to know it at least once a year. Do you know your son's BNP number? No. Okay. Um, are you going to find out? Do you want to know? I, he, he's never had a blood draw besides, um, whenever he was in, in the NICU hospital. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I guess there's nothing stopping me from asking because I also found an amazing pediatrician. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you just asked, I asked, um, Dr. Grover, who's my son's pediatrician. And I just said, you know, um, he's five. He's a study baby. He's a PPCM baby. I mean, you know, obviously me having cardiac death while basically him marinating in my belly is what could happen to him. So the follow-ups are very important. Like, and I know this. So I have on the refrigerator, I have a EKG and a BNP scheduled, which I will definitely move forward with i was kind of pushing it because of covid i didn't want they to do did an that. echo for jack in the hospital and i do have i have his echo what's his ef um it was it whatever it was for a baby it was fine it was i don't think i've read it more than twice because i feel like reading rereading the medical records kind of digs up a little bit of the trauma yeah so if i didn't absolutely. if i didn't keep it mentally in my mind that it wasn't a high enough number okay or it wasn't a a number that An was, alert Yes. So okay. everything, his echo was fine. They did EKG. They did so many e- EGs for brain activity Sure. because they of his skull them. fracture and brain bleed. And, yeah. um, his, um, his head scans, the one where they told me there was all this gray matter in, in the front of his head where he, um, he re- received that trauma from birth and they didn't know if he would ever walk, talk, eat How himself, he anything. Today? He's fine. He's fine. We were in the hospital and I was like, I can't believe this is happening. And Mm -hmm. I wanted, I wanted him baptized. And so we got the priest to come to down there and Mm -hmm. he looked at me and he said, he's going to go home. You know, you could wait and do this at home. And I'm like, how, how, how do you know this? And he, he said, it's going to be okay. So he put oil on his forehead. They took him off for this. And he came back no gray matter anymore. It was just like, I feel like I got my miracle with Jack. It was so, it was just, it was crazy. So I feel like that was my once in a lifetime miracle that Mm -hmm. I I, I thought I was done. This is it. Nothing else, please. And then I went into heart failure. So I, 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 even if I had to waste all my miracles on him, I still would just want him to be okay. But I, I'm still fighting like hell for, for women that are like me. I, I, to, to, to promote awareness, you know, you are your own advocate. At the end of the day, you're the only person that has your own back that could, that has privy to your medical records that can call and make your own medical appointments. So get in there and get it taken care of. They just, we need, we need, 
women to stand up for themselves and not have to fear, is this medical bill going to be so high? What am I, it's all the other things that pile on top of it. Like the whole reason I didn't want to go to the hospital was I, I don't want to be back in there. My baby's little, you know, like this, it's just not, you need to be able to take your child with you, take your, your partner and your child with you or, or make accommodations that your child could stay with somebody while you're getting checked out. It's just not, it's not easy being a woman. It's not easy having a baby, being a woman. And it's really not easy having motherhood uh, tarnished by this thing that's no fault of your own. Yeah, this disease that's all preventable with a simple blood test. Absolutely. It's infuriating. You don't even need another needle. All you have to do is just get your doctor to add it to the to the form. To the that's pit. it. Exactly. It's in the same drop, the same vial of fluid. Yeah, that's it's it. just, it makes no sense. And here we're having this conversation for the first time when women have been giving birth since the beginning of time. This really should be an ancient conversation, not the start of a conversation. And so that's why this docu-series in the podcast and all that's following, um, you know, this platform that I am providing um, and basically, you know, going to keep it very real and very raw of like literally the painful truth of the United States maternal mortality deaths and the suffering and the survival of it and what we what we strive for because you know at the end of the day you know our experience has been severely um you know taken from us mm-hmm. and other opportunities and so for us to talk about this it's one thing when we're venting and we're talking and, you know, you and I have this, you know, common, like, you know, heart sister, you know, unite passion, but it's for really our children's children. This is, we're standing up today for tomorrow. You know, we're, we're, we're basically making a stand, you know, in 2022 that, We don't want to wait till 2024 to have the diagnosis already FDA approved and the kit and the instruments provided in every hospital, every OBGY office in the United States of America, mandatory with raising the standards, labs, and testings for all pregnancies as early as if she's even 14 years old, you know, and you know, there are some girls that get pregnant that young, you know, Mm -hmm. 16, you know, I don't care how young they are, because this is a young woman disease. It's not an elderly woman disease. It's it's a high risk for young women. And they got that really backwards. They were like, Oh, when you're a certain age, you're high risk. No, 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 no. Every woman is at high risk with peripartum cardiomyopathy, especially with the lack of awareness, education, and training, and never having a diagnosis in gynecology whatsoever and have to totally rely on cardiology to maybe possibly be saved. That's where we come in and our voices not only speak for ourselves, for our children's children, but especially for the ones that are on the other side that are dead, stayed on the other side and kicking and screaming and saying, what the hell happened? I was a Mm -hmm. healthy woman. I was a healthy girl my whole life. I was a healthy woman. This should have never have happened to me and furious and rightly so. You know, we have angels literally surrounding us right now saying, you know, literally going, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like what she said, <laughs> Our <know>? team. <laughs> yeah. because, you know, this is a, a, a powerful movement where no more women should, ju- should die moving forward. I agree. And so, you know, whether this is a medical community doctor that's listening or whether if it's a woman who's pregnant and doesn't know what's wrong with her and needs to self-advocate, whether it's a a birth keeper, doula, midwife, or, you know, some holistic woman, you know, we all want it to be joyful. But the reality is, is that sometimes 
we don't plan for this and people plan. And what do we say? God laughs. Mm -hmm. So, um, we just have to like apply, you know, practice, you know, policy and practice and, and apply practice with not just textbook, but having the common sense and the intuition to know this woman possibly might be experiencing something that this blood test is not picking up. So let's try another blood test. Let's try another blood test until this is mandatory. I think something common with all of the women that I've ever spoke to about this was that something was wrong, whether they just felt it themselves or you, it's clear as day visible on them, be it swelling, breathing, whatever, right. something is wrong and someone needs to take us seriously and listen when we yes. speak at these gynecological office visits. Yeah. I feel like and it's just so you're in, you're out. That's it. You know, it's just, it's too fast. You see too many people and it's, it's really hard. It is. And, and everything falls on deaf ears. So I appreciate all the work that you're doing with this and mm -hmm. you're doing amazing things with your podcast. And this video is going to be so insightful. Men, I think it's going to save lives. Everyone across the board. I, I thank you. Uh, like, you know, with my whole heart, it's, it's taken me a lot to get here. It's taken me, you know, five years to grow my nonprofit. It's taken me every day, hard work. Um, you know, we don't really get donations. So um, I take on the TV shows and movies that I work in Hollywood, and I take that money. And I put aside to help other women. I put that aside for the nonprofit. I use my locations company to grow this platform. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, with this production company and the support of the production company that's producing this, it's just all really come together. And, um, you know, I appreciate your time today. And oh, thank you. I don't have my, I don't have my little family here because they're, they're a little loud, but. <gasps> Oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to post, send me that photo and I'll, and I'll put, I'll put it in the, the video. <laughs> Very cute. I mean, your family is just lovely and beautiful and like moving forward, like many blessings, you know, that you all have and stay, you know, in good health, you know, mentally, physically, and, you know, spiritually and like grow with that rise above all the, you know, the chaos, I'm so, but learn I'm from so it. thankful to be able to do this. I'm thankful to Good. be able to have this conversation with you. Somebody that, that gets it, you know? Yes. And not, I, not I hope this gave it. you justice, some sort yeah. of justice. But I, I appreciate everything that you do. Everything. Well, it's more than my pleasure. And I, I appreciate your time in participating because I, I can't do this without you and other women. And it's, and, you know, like, again, I, I, you know, I look forward to, you know, us, you know, just now meeting you and seeing you person to person. I, you know, I have this now, this, this other connection other than just, you know, non impersonable Facebook time. Uh -huh. Um, so no, I, I do appreciate it. And, and thank well, if you, you ever so, need so anything, much. you have my, all my contact information. So yes, I do. Whatever, whatever, reach out. If you need me for anything, I'm, I'm, I'm always here. I stay at home with him. So mm -hmm. that's oh, vice versa. <sighs> and thank you. And, and, you know, all my love and I will definitely keep in touch. Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. <laughs> thank you. Ma. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us and listening to the PPCM Fund podcast. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. PPCM's Painful Truth is made possible through the generous support of donors like you. Help us spread the awareness by donating at ppcmfund.com or click the link below to become a member through Ko-fi. Also, remember to join us every Monday and Friday for Mom Day Fitness. Have a great day.